Well, we have a heat dome in the center of the country. We have a hurricane slash tropical storm that's impacting the West Coast. And we have things to watch in South America when it comes to the weather here this week. Joining us now as we talk about what is all going on across the country and around the world, Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions is joining us once again here today. Eric, good to catch up with you. And uh, man, oh man, no shortage of things to talk about here this week once again. Yeah, you know, this past weekend, just watching what was left of Hurricane Hillary spread out across the West was impressive. And uh, certainly something a week ago when we talked, you know, we weren't really into, right? Last Monday, it was like, all right, we're keeping an eye on this system that's off of Mexico. There's a chance it pulls into California and delivers some rainfall. But of course, as the week went on, we watched Hillary rapidly strengthen uh, midweek last week. And then this is a look at the rainfall. So through 6 a.m. this morning, we've had places in California pick up oh, over six and someplace over 10 inches of rain. And that spread into to Nevada, it's getting into Idaho. It's going to hit the Blue Mountains, which are in the eastern, northeastern part of of, um, of Oregon later today as well. And it's interesting that the remnants of this will pull into Canada. So they're going to, there's going to be some East Pacific tropical cyclone moisture that gets all the way to the Canadian prairie. Now you've probably seen a lot of the news feeds today and yesterday just showing you that the flooding, the debris flow, the rock slides, the mud slides in California, and that unfortunately is. Is, uh, is is quite tragic and uh, we'll continue to watch that today the mojave desert by the way did pick up in some places over two years worth of rainfall just in 48 hours so but you notice the rest of the country is just uh is bone dry i mean there's mm -hmm. just a big section of the country that's going to sit under this massive ridge and that's going to really shut us down for for um you know for uh, moisture for a while well, and I think this next map is a great illustration of that. You just look at it, and it's a, it almost looks like the eye of a hurricane over <laughs> just the entire center of the country, over most of the Corn Belt here, Eric. Yeah, and that's, but uh, the pressure is the opposite direction, right? There's a big high pressure cell sitting there. And the one thing I don't like about this is that even though that big ridge, which will be around all the way until the end of the week, uh, keeps us really hot and really dry. Once it leaves and moves back to the West, we don't recover the moisture, which looks like into week two, we're drier in the Corn Belt as well. But we've got five straight days of excessive heat in the midsection of the country. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw this, but yesterday in Lawrence, Kansas, they hit a heat index of 134. Uh, that was uh, fueled by 81 degree dew point temperatures when the temperatures got up over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But you notice it's all a ring of fire patterns, we call this. So you see to the south, there's a tropical system coming out of the Gulf that's going to go into southern Texas. It then gets pulled through the four corner states. But if you are not in the western plains, like I'm talking Colorado, parts of Kansas, parts of Nebraska, chances of getting rain this week are pretty limited. So you have to be on the ring of this big ridge in order to find some rainfall. So I got to ask, you know, is this really going to damage the crop? Uh, there are places that it will. I'm thinking about those places that have been quite dry in Iowa and Wisconsin. There's a section of Nebraska, big chunk of Missouri. Uh, so, uh, but other places, a lot of the corn crop is far enough along that I don't expect this to cause major problems. Um, and to be honest, some of the bean crops, especially the double crop beans in the East need more heat on them. So mm -hmm. I talked to some farmers in Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee last week, and I'm like, no, 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 we, go ahead and bring it on. But it's a monster. Uh, this image here, just to kind of show you this, you notice right over like where the quad cities between Illinois and Iowa are, there's the number 600. That represents uh, decameters. So this tells us that the height of the 500 millibar pressure surface is 6,000 meters above our head. Now, why is that even significant? If you look at that in terms of standard deviation, that's four standard deviations above the mean, which means this is a large, large ridge, one of the biggest in recorded history. So it's going to get hot. The overnight lows are going to be well above 70. They're going to be up in the 80s at times as far north as the southern uh, border of Minnesota, the northern border of Iowa. And so it's going to be uh, it's going to be incredible a big 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 heat wave well and i pulled up the uh, latest u.s drought monitor as well just to add to the illustration eric and obviously mm -hmm. this uh this dome this heat ridge sitting right over those areas that you kind of talked about where we still have some drought issues and it is something to watch i think again especially for soybeans this time of year eric yeah, I agree. And but it is important to note that since late July through August, that drought area in the middle part of the country, <clears throat> excuse me, did see a lot of rainfall, mm -hmm. multiple big storm systems. So we've recovered a little bit of the topsoil moisture, which means that's going to get evaporated first. Uh, and by the way, we will probably see, you know, evaporation rates per day 
on an acre of corn, roughly 3,000 to 4,000 gallons. That's how wow. much we're going to put in the lower atmosphere out of this. So there's moisture to be evaporated. It's going to be disgusting uh, and and very uncomfortable. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what a ridge does. Well, you mentioned that tropical system coming out of the Gulf and into Texas. Uh, let's take a look at what's going on in the Atlantic. A lot of the talk this week about Hurricane Hillary on the West Coast, but what's going on in the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf right now? Yeah, there's really only one system to talk about. And if you look in the Gulf, that one that has the number 70% on it, that is the one that's going to be going to Southern Texas. Franklin, Gert, and Emily all named over the weekend. They're getting pulled into the North Atlantic because the Bermuda High is a bit shifted east right now. And that's part of the, the reason why it's going in that direction. Uh, so at this stage, even though the Atlantic's kind of had the lid taken off and it's active, none of these systems are really poised to hit the United States, except for the system brewing in the Gulf of Mexico. But I love this image by a guy named Tomer Berg. He is out of uh, Oklahoma University. This is a beautiful image with the sea surface temperatures in the background and the National Hurricane Center forecast on top. Good, good map. Well, let's talk South America here, Eric. That's mm -hmm. another point of uh, that we need to watch, another point of emphasis. I'll pull up this map first. Uh, walk us through what you're seeing right now in South America. Yeah, so there's there's a couple things to think about. The El Nino that has been really developing, it's now, you know, 1.2 to 1.3 degrees Celsius above average. So this is a this is a real El Nino going. What we typically worry about is northern Brazil having dry conditions. And you see that here. This is the October, November, December forecast that was released from our seasonal models. And this is a good representation, honestly, of all of them that was released. So wet south, you notice very wet in southern Brazil, Uruguay, parts of Argentina, but very dry north. Okay, so I think about this, and I would just tell you that about 60% of the growing area here is forecast to have near normal to wetter than normal conditions, 40% drier. But what's interesting is this is the, what the seasonal models are putting out. If you show that other image I, I, brought, I gave you here, this is the one that shows you the sub-seasonal model. This is the month of September. And you notice there's a lot more green on this map. We would expect because of El Nino for there to be drier risks north. But some of the sub-seasonal forecasts are suggesting that three weeks from now, when they get to start planting in Brazil, that they might have enough moisture to go after it. Now, they need, honestly, about two inches of rain. So they, we're, we're, we're talking 50 plus millimeters of rainfall to get things cranking. But um, this is this will be important because if these rains do show up on time, Brazil gets off to a good start, um, it's going to be something that I think could really influence the markets going forward. We won't see a gap that has to be filled between the U.S. and, and South American markets. And by the way, the same features that are driving this are also potentially increasing the risks of more rainfall in the United States later in September and October. And I don't have a good feeling on when the break will happen, but maybe late September to October, we could get in some cool air across the midsection of the country as well. So all of that's ahead of us. And that's why we talk every Monday, right? Exactly. Well, and I know that if we start getting rain September, October, that's right around harvest time here in the U.S. So that is definitely something to monitor for sure. Eric, before we let you go, any other final thoughts, anything else you're watching around the globe? I know we've had issues in China. We, we've got a lot of different things going on. Anything else you're keeping an eye on right now? Yeah, I mean, there's drier risks, longer range in uh, Australia and Indonesia, uh, Europe, and not really getting a strong signal from the Indian monsoon seemed to slow down a bit early this year. I'm not sure what we're going to hear out of that. But yeah, we're starting to see more news articles about the potential problems from the flooding that happened in China. This was 20, 20 plus days ago. But I'm unsure of what major crops it hit in that area. So keep an eye on all of that, plus El Nino, which will likely be a dominant factor for the rest of summer than getting into fall and winter. So be prepared for a lot of mentions onto how that's going to control the pattern. Well, I know folks can sign up for your weekly weather newsletter online. We'll have the links on our website. They can also find more information, more detailed uh, weather forecasts for your area, ag-wx.com, ag-wx.com. With that, Eric Snodgrass, Nutrient Ag Solutions. Always great to chat with you, friend, my friend, and uh, have an awesome week. We'll talk to you next week. Sounds good.